uh, appreciate it. Um, yeah, my pleasure. Yeah, so I guess we'll start off with obviously with you know COVID and everything that uh, that took part last year. Um, obviously, put a damper on the sports season in 2020, but uh, things are starting to pick up now. Um, obviously, there's a lot of different things going on with you know the virtual interviews and and player access that way. Um, how has uh, COVID uh, really changed the way that you that you have covered sports? Um, you know, in the last year. Yeah. <clears throat> so true. Um, well, when this thing uh, hits back in March, I was covering the Big East tournament at New York's Madison Square Garden. Um, and I was going to be shifting back and forth between Manhattan and Brooklyn to cover the Atlantic 10 tournament in URI. So uh, <clears throat> we were there uh, for Wednesday night's game. And then the first game on Thursday, all of a sudden at halftime, they announced that they're canceling the remainder of the tournament because of COVID concerns. Um so, uh, and then while we were doing our reports that night at six o'clock, um, the NCAA announced that the NCAA tournament was, was canceled. So <clears throat> we were kind of at the epicenter of it when it, when it all went down, at least for, for college sports. And, um, and things changed dramatically ever since then. Uh, it was tough because at first, uh, you know, people said, geez, what did you have to cover? Well, while we didn't have uh, any games to cover, we had plenty of sports news to cover. So there was there was the salvation in, in knowing that. And then it gradually we returned, you know, we had some hockey, we had some basketball, um, you know, unfortunately we didn't have any high school or, or college sports to talk about, but, uh, and then the football season rolled around and, you know, fingers crossed, it looks like they're going to get through the season um, without any, any major setbacks. So, you know, the way that it's changed, um, you know, we, we're doing stuff now kind of like you and I are doing yeah. right now with these zoom calls and, and it's good and it's bad. Um, you know, the, the good part is that, you know, we have access to material that, that sometimes we aren't able to, to get without uh, a lot of work. For example, anytime the Patriots played on the road this past season, uh, we just got on the Patriots Zoom calls and we were able to, to hear uh, what everybody had to say that they put on that call. Um, whereas in the past, what we would do is, let's say that they played in uh, the Jets in New York. We would have to call the New York NBC station and say, hey, listen, can you get us some some post game reaction? And then we'd have it fed to us or speak to maybe one of the stations in Boston about getting a satellite feed. So it was expensive and it was, you know, jumping through a lot of hoops. So we don't have to do that now. But the bad part is, you know, we don't have um, really anything that anybody else doesn't have, um, you know, because when you're there all the time, whether it be for the Patriots or or URI or PC basketball or anything like that, um, you know, you're able to strike up a conversation and have sometimes a bit of a relationship. So there's right. that familiarity and, and the ability to get material uh, or answers to questions that maybe you wouldn't get ordinarily in a, in a big group setting. So, you know, uh, it's great that we have it. Um, but, you know, I, I wonder what the future will bring and whether we'll get back to, to what right. the way we did it before. Yeah, so. and, and that's what I was going to ask next. Do you think that is this is something that uh, the leagues are, are going to kind of switch over to? You know, you might see, you maybe get that in-person interaction, but then you might get, you know, with the larger settings, you might get more of the, you know, the online, the Zoom and, and all of that. Um, that's a good question. And we have a lot of conversations around uh, the sports department here and also with other people in, in, in other positions in sports, um, you know, around the country, I, I keep asking the question, you know, how, what's it going to look like when the smoke clears and the smoke being COVID. Um, and, you know, they think that, that, um, you know, the zoom stuff is here to stay. I, I think that a lot of teams like it. I think a lot of players like it because it's controlled yeah. and, and, and all. Um, but I, I think that, um, you know, they will be uh, under pressure, assuming that it's safe to do it from a health perspective, to return to what we had before. To the extent that we had it before, probably not. But I think that at least they'll let us in the room. Um, you know, maybe these press conferences that they have, were, you know, at a podium, while there will be Zoom availability, maybe they'll also have some uh, reporters in, in a room that can ask questions. So it's... Uh, it's interesting to talk about. I don't know what the, the real answer is. We're going to have to wait and see, but you know, it is something that we're thinking about right now. Definitely. Definitely. And uh, you know, I kind of want to just start from the beginning, obviously when, when was the first time that you really thought and said, this is something I want to go into as far as the broadcasting goes. When I was in high school. 
Yeah. Um, you know, I, I was very fortunate when I was in high school, I'm, I'm like, like freshman or sophomore that, you know, there's different clubs when you're in high school and there was a, a club that was going to go to a local radio station. This is in Massachusetts and learn about radio and be, be there once a week. Um, so uh, I started that and um, I started to do that, that little club there and was there once a week and got to know some of the people who uh, work there and then, you know, started coming in a little bit more and, you know, I, they, I just, uh, I wouldn't go away. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I started in radio, which, you know, a lot of people who are coming into the business now, um, that's not their path, but that was my path. And I, I'm really thankful for it because, you know, when you start in this business, um, you know, you worry about how you sound, you worry about how you look, uh, when you're starting just in, um, radio, you just worry about how you sound, you worry about your delivery and, and most importantly about your writing. And then, you know, eventually I added the, the TV part of it and it was a little bit easier transition for me than it would have been otherwise. So, uh, that was in high school. I went to, uh, Ithaca college in upstate New York, uh, w was in the communications, um, department there and got a degree and kept working summers at that radio station. And then when I got out, I, um, worked at the radio station and was lucky enough to be hired to do, um, uh, a nightly uh, sports news on channel 27 in Worcester. Um, they had a 10 o'clock show. So I'd work during the day in radio and then about six o'clock I would zip off to Worcester and I would do the 10 o'clock news sports. And, uh, and then someone from uh, Providence saw me, they needed someone to fill in one day a week. So I added that to my schedule. Um, that was, you know, it was always radio almost six days a week and TV pretty much seven days a week. And, you know, I would collapse for a few hours in between and I'd make the ride from from uh, Natick, Massachusetts, all the way down to uh, to Providence. So and fortunately, I got hired full time uh, at WJR Channel 10 uh, after about a year. And I've been here ever since this past April uh, was my 40th anniversary here at uh, Channel 10. So it's been a long road for you, for sure. Um, yeah, it doesn't feel that way, though. Matt. Yeah. You know, I mean, it, yeah, I think of it, you know, 40 years, it's just uh it feels like it's flown by. So, yeah. but, but how, how important were those early years for you in high school? And then in, in college, obviously, like just like you mentioned your schedule right there. I mean, it, it was, it was a grind. And I, and I feel like a lot of the people in the industry, um, you know, when they first start, that's what they say. It really is. It's a grind. You just have to do whatever you can, whatever work you can, you can pick up, you have to do. And, and obviously that, that, you know, you're no different um, with how you started. Yeah, I, that's true. And, and, you know, I was, it was, it quickly turned into a passion of mine, something I, I desperately wanted to do. And I was lucky to be able to have the opportunities that I got. I um, had been, had been teaching a class, a sports casting class at Rhode Island College for many years. And I, first day, I always start with the question, um, you know, how many of you would like to be on TV? And you know, everybody in that class raises their hand, right? Yeah. Um, and I said, okay, you know, why? Why do you want to be on? Well, I, I want to be on TV. Everybody will see me. You know, I just, I really think, yeah. and that's not the right answer. You know, I, I, I want to be on TV because I want to tell good stories, you know, and that, that's what it's got to be about. And I said, okay, you know, so everybody wants to be on TV. Yes. Okay. Um, you cool with working nights? A couple of hands go down. Yeah. You cool with working weekends? A few more hands go down. How about, you know, holidays? I've worked every Thanksgiving. Yeah. You know, since, since <laughs> high school, you know, and, and all of a sudden now the hands that are up dwindle to just a, a, a select few. So, you know, it is, you know, there's, there's a lot of sacrifice that you have to make. Um, but there's so many great rewards and, um, you know, and I've been, I've been very fortunate in my career. Uh, yeah. And, um, you, what, what was that? Was there somebody that, uh, you really looked up to in the broadcasting field when you first started or when you were, when you were younger? Um, you know, I, so I grew up in Sudbury, Massachusetts, uh, and I watched all the Boston stations, you know, back then there was no, no ESPN at that point. So, you know, I would watch the guys who were on the, the three television stations, which is what we had back then, uh, doing the local sports news, um, guys like that some of them still around uh, len berman um dick stockton um don gillis uh was was the big guy at channel five in boston when i came up and and dick o'connell and and 
uh, Bob Gamir. So, you know, I'd watch all those guys and, you know, what is it that, you know, makes these guys so good at what they do? And, you know, I think it's important that, you know, when you decide to do this, you don't try and imitate somebody. You, you just, you want to be yourself, but you do want to look at, uh, you know, styles and the way different people approach their job and, and whatever you see that you like, you need to, to incorporate it. And I, I don't know if that's unusual or not. You know, I often, I often hear, uh, uh, you know, music composers and singers. In fact, Billy Joel, I remember hearing uh, something him say, you know, I, I heard so-and-so sing a song and that kind of inspired me to do this song. And, you know, so it's same, kind of the same thing for me. I, you know, I don't necessarily think that I've imitated anybody, but I think that I've tried to incorporate some of their, their style into, into what I do. So and do you still do that today with uh, maybe some of the current guys around, uh, you know, around the country? Yeah. You know, cause I'm always curious, um, you know, how did that guy get there, you know, and what keeps that guy there? What, what makes him so special? And uh, so, yeah, so I do try and, you know, keep an eye on, on different people to see, uh, you know, how they're doing and what they're doing. Uh, it's a, it's a constant thing every day, every day, you know, trying to, you know, uh, to get better, you know, yeah. in my mind, I've only, you know, in 40 years, I've, I've maybe had a, you know, a perfect sports cast once or twice. Yeah. So. And how important was, uh, when you first started was, was networking. I mean, just talking to people, um, from wherever you were, where there was the radio station in college, um, you know, when you're working the one night a week in Providence, um, you know, how big was just picking people's brains and really getting to know different people. Yeah, I, I think that was that was important for me, and I think it's important for anybody still now getting into the business. And I was just talking with uh, one of my coworkers here tonight. We haven't had interns in the building since, you know, since COVID hit, and there's no word on when, um, um, you know, on when that may return and and how important it is. The two guys that are actually three guys. We have two full time guys who work with me in the sports department, and another guy who. Um, it, kind of crosses over from news to sports sometimes all three of those guys were interns for me you know and how important yeah. an internship is and, and that course that I talked about that I I um I taught at Rick um you know I I ended every email that I sent my students with have you gotten an internship today and that you know is so important like you say to network to know somebody I mean if if you were an intern here and I got to know you and I, you know, and, and you proved yourself that you were a good worker and that you were really dedicated, you really wanted to get into this business for the right reasons. Chances are, if we have an opening, you're going to be one of the first people that I call because, you know, you're a known quantity. Right. You know, it's, it's tough when you send a resume blindly to someplace and, and try and get a foot in the door that way. So that's, that's why I think, you know, internships are so important and, you know, it was important for me when I, when I started. Yeah. And I mean, you mentioned um, you're teaching the class at Rick and, and asking people, you know, if they wanted to be on TV and then the hands slowly start to dwindle down when you ask them the different uh, questions about it. How often do you see maybe somebody that might come into a station and they think that's what they want to do. And then it, maybe it doesn't necessarily work out that way once they find out really what goes into everything. Yeah, uh, there's quite a few. And we've had people who have have left the business coming here to work. And, and a lot of times it's it's not this isn't their first station that they work at They They work at a much smaller and a much smaller market. And they come here and they realize, you know, now maybe five or six years into their career that, hey, you know what, this really isn't for me. And uh, so we have have seen people uh, leave. And I think, you know, that that goes back to what I said about internships. Internships are great way to find out if it's something you want to do or something you don't want to do. So, you know, for those people who have come in here and worked and left, you know, you know, if you find out in, in your internship that, you know, it's really not for me, it's not, you know, that's not how I want to live my life. Right. At least you, you know, can go a different direction with your education so that you can come out and find a job in a different field um, as opposed to, you know, coming in and doing six years in television and realizing that it's not something you want to do. And then you started uh, here at NBC 10 in Providence uh, in 1980. Uh, yeah. you, you said, uh, like you mentioned, you were working the one night a week and then you got the call um, to go full time. Do you remember that, uh, you know, when you got that call and, and kind of what your feelings were when you when you landed that full time gig here? Um, 
Yeah, I mean, it was, um, it, you know, obviously it, it meant so much to me. Um, I had, uh, you know, I had tried to get into all sorts of different places and wasn't having any any luck. And then to, you know, to get in here, uh, you know, I was, I was excited. I mean, I you know, I think I got a, had a two year contract that you know was going to pay me nineteen thousand dollars the first year and twenty thousand the second year. So you know, and I, how excited I was yeah. for that. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, you know, it's 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 great. You know, uh, I'm so lucky because. You know, if you can do anything that's your passion for your entire life, you know, you're lucky. My daughter, when she was in high school, you know, I would bring her all sorts of ideas of, you know, something that she wanted to do and study in college. And I'd present her with ideas and, and she would always shoot back to me, at me. The first question was, how much money do they make? And after hearing that a bunch of times, I finally said to her, I said, it really, it doesn't matter how much money you make. You got to be happy. Right. You got to be able to get out of bed in the morning and, and want to go to do what you want to do. Yeah. And if you're lucky to have that, you know, the riches hopefully will follow, you know? So, um, you know, I've been lucky to be able to, to do what I wanted. I've always wanted to do and, and continue to do here. So. Which is great. I mean, like you mentioned, a lot of people go into a field, you know, thinking about the money and they get in and then they don't necessarily really like what they do. And, and it's yeah. a struggle, like you said, to get out of bed every morning. It's uh, it's crazy. But uh, obviously, you're one of the lucky ones that, uh, you know, you wake up every day and you and you and you really love what you do. Yeah, thankful for that. Yes. And so you start off as just a, uh, a journalist here at NBC 10 when you first got the job. And then did you work your way up to eventually being the sports director? So, yeah, when I started that one day a week was just anchoring uh, either a Saturday or a Sunday, uh, those shows. And then when I was hired full time, I was uh, the five day a week sports reporter. Chris Clark was the uh, main sports person here. And then um, they ended up putting me on the six o'clock show. So I reported during the day and anchored at six and went home at 630. And Chris was he's still here doing the 11. And then eventually um, I did the six and 11. And that's where I've, I've been ever since. So. That's the way it happened. Yeah. And, um, you know, with covering with NBC 10, obviously being the local station covering the local sports, um, you know, how how important is it to really, you know, cover these these high school kids and these in these youth athletes here? It's very important. I mean, yeah. we uh, you know, we get to cover all the big stuff too, the Super right. Bowls and the World Series and stuff. But, you know, some of the most rewarding stories that I've done has been. Uh, with um, the high school kids, uh, you know, I always remark when people ask me, oh, the, the best stories that you've done, certainly the, you know, the big time events that everybody covers are great. But, you know, in 96, uh, the Cranston Western Little Leaguers went to the Little League World Series in Williamsport, and I followed them there. And, and they won the U.S. championship, the only Rhode Island team to ever do that. And to, you know, follow those kids and get to know them and their parents was just fantastic. And, and, and then I think it was was it uh, maybe 10 years, 20 years later to catch up with those kids again? And that's great. And, yeah. you know, and all the high school stuff that we do the, you know, to have these, uh, you know, years later, these adults yeah. come up to me and say, do you remember you covered me when I was in high school? And that, that's always a, a real kick. And, uh, you know, and even to, for these people to, co to come up and say, uh, um, you know, you covered my dad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if you want to, you know, if you want to be made to feel old, uh, <laughs> but that's great. You know, I mean, yeah. you know, to have a role in, in, in young people's lives like that, uh, yeah. you know, hopefully in a moment when they shine um, is really a cool thing to do. Exactly. I mean, we, we've had a few of those here in Rhode Island, you know, guys that have, um, you know, kids that have started up in high school and have made it to, you know, had success in the college level and the pro level. Um, you know, like Will Blackman, Jamie Silva, um, you yeah. know, some of those guys. So um, do you I remember, mean, do just, you remember covering them? Absolutely. I remember covering them and, and the other guys that, that, you know, I, I remember um, specific Rocco Baldelli, Yeah. you know, I covered him in, in high school and, and then up through, and now he's the manager of the Minnesota twins. Yeah. Uh, you know, another famous one that I always talk about is um, Elizabeth Beisel, the Olympic swimmer. Yeah. Uh, I first was, um, she was brought to my attention when she was eight years old. So the pitch was, hey, listen, you want to come do a story on a young girl who is a championship swimmer, but is also a concert pianist and a concert violinist. And wow. she's eight years old, eight years old. Wow. 
so uh I'm like yeah uh, that's pretty cool i had you know my daughter at the time might have been uh three or four years old and obviously you want to start your kid on the right path i'm like how do you do that you know what i mean so, yeah. so we did the story and you know and then i kind of lost contact and and then you know she's starting to qualify for the olympics and i'm like oh my gosh that's the girl i did the story on when she was eight years yeah. old and then you know and she was uh you know, just as outgoing and, and, and fun to talk to and, and still had that great smile when, when she was 16 and went to her first Olympics and, and subsequent Olympics. And, you know, it's just great to see people like that come up and be successful. You know, good people, you know, good people like Elizabeth and, and, uh, and of course, Rocco and, and you mentioned Will Blackman and, yeah. and Jamie Silva. So, um, yeah, that, that's really some of the most rewarding things that, that, that happen in this job when you can, you know, can have, um, you know, a relationship with people like that. Exactly. Cause it's much different from covering a professional athlete, you know, with these kids in high school, you, like you said, you kind of build a relationship with them and then you kind of see them grow to college professional and Olympics. And, uh, it must be pretty crazy for you to, to see, you know, those kids succeed. Yeah. You know, for a lot of these, you know, professional players, their story, their personal story has been told a million times, right? You know, their performance has been evaluated a million times. They've been interviewed a million times. Um, so, you know, it, it's not the same feeling, you know, when you want to go and you want to do a feature on them or you want to talk to them, it's like, you know, here comes the media again, you know, and sometimes right. if you're lucky enough, you, you know, you have a, you know, able to establish a relationship with them. But, um, you know, I've always find that it's, it's even more satisfying with like some of the the, uh, the youth uh, sports right. people that we've spoken about. So, And um, obviously you've seen the growth of, of Boston sports, um, you know, from the Patriots being, you know, bottom of the barrel to the last 20 years of dominance. And, you know, you've seen the Red Sox struggle to winning World Series. Um, you know, you've seen the Celtics obviously uh, do their thing in, in the Bruins as well. But um, you know, how has that been for you to see kind of the growth and just see the, the dominance that that this city has had for the last 20 years? Well, I'll tell you, Matt, you know, if I didn't um, have the opportunities like that, uh, that I've had over the past 20 years, you know, I've been to nine Super Bowls and, and how many, four, five World Series and NBA championships. I've covered a couple of Olympics, um, Stanley Cup final. Uh, if I didn't have those opportunities, and those experiences, you know, I don't think, you know, when I look back on this someday that it would have been as rewarding. Uh, right. So, you know, I, I mean, we, you got to agree that, you know, the last 20 years has been the most successful uh, stretch of pro sports in this area yeah. uh, ever, you know, or, or maybe in any city, you know, with all of the, the championships, I think, what is it? 12 combined uh, yeah. the four professional sports teams. It's been unbelievable. Yeah. It's been crazy. What's uh What's been the most memorable championship that you've covered? Um, I would have to say that it was the um, 2004 Red Sox, their first yeah. World Series championship in 86 years. Um, I was in St. Louis when they um, they clinched the, the World Series. <clears throat> Just to see the reaction of people in the stands, uh, Red Sox fans who were there, there were a couple, several thousand of them. Just to see their reaction when, when the Red Sox finally made this happen uh was something i'll never forget we um uh they celebrated on the field which traditionally it happens in in the clubhouse but the Sox celebrated on the field which was great for all of the fans who were there to be able to to witness it and, and take part in it and i told the photographer that i was working with that night i said hey listen you know try and get some shots of different red Sox fans in the stands so that we can use it for a story for the next day. And I went in the stands and talked to several people <clears throat> later that night. We, I pulled an all nighter cause we were on the, the sunrise show the next morning and I'm going through the video and I see this one shot that the photographer got that just took my breath away. It was a shot of a guy in the stands appeared to be by himself, older gentleman, you know, 50 years old, whatever. And he's got a red Sox shirt on and he, um, as the camera zooms in on him, he doesn't realize that the camera's on him. He raises one finger to the sky and he mouths the words for you, dad. Wow. So, I mean, I still get chills when I, yeah. when I tell that story. I mean, you know, here's a guy who probably went to a million Red Sox games with his dad growing up and his dad is no longer with us. And he's sharing his moment, that yeah. moment with his dad, who's, 
you know, no longer yeah. with us. And, and there were a million stories like yeah. that, you know, not only at the ballpark, but, you know, people who were watching on television. I, one guy I talked to that night was, was with his adult son. And he said, I, I said, what is this like for you? And he was a Red Sox fan. He said, yeah. you know, with apologies to my, to my wife, <laughs> this being able to share this with my son is the greatest moment of my life. Yeah. So it was just, it was just a magical, magical time and a, and, um, and a great moment. Cause I grew up, you know, uh, watching the Red Sox yeah. <clears throat> and, uh, uh, you know, my dad was a Yankee fan. So I, you know, obviously he got the first phone call that <laughs> night, but, uh, uh, it was just, it, it was just, uh, you know, great. I, I wouldn't trade that, that one for anything. Yeah. I mean, and, and you've seen the, the distress from, from Red Sox fans, obviously with Bill Buckner and you've oh. seen all, you've seen all the tragedy. And, and that know. night, that night must have been uh, extremely special, especially yeah. for you to be able to cover that, uh, you know, right know, in St. Louis. Yeah. Well, I was, I was at Shea in 1986 when that happened. Uh, with Oh, Bob. wow. Okay. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that was, uh, that was crazy. So to be there for, you know, when it was a happy time right. was, uh, was, was great. Yeah. And for them to be able to clinch at home, like they did uh, in 2013 must have been great for you too. Yeah. Um, so, uh, that was great. It was obviously a little bit different experience because we were in uh, uh, we were in Arizona for their second one in 2007. So to be home was was very cool yeah. uh, for the fans there. And then an 18 out in L.A. was yeah. was really kind of a, a cool experience, too. So, um, yeah, it's great to be great to be at those events. Oh, yeah, definitely. And uh, obviously you mentioned you've been to nine Super Bowls. Um, what's the, what's the best city that you've been to as far as the whole oh, city? It's a good a question. Uh, uh, let me start with the one I didn't like. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not a big cold weather fan and out yeah. in Minneapolis, Minnesota, it was just, yeah. oh my gosh, you know, it was so cold and, and, and the boss wanted me to be outside doing my live reports and I'm like, cause <laughs> it was all based, uh, the, the teams were based at the mall of America and right. all the media was based there too. So you know, we were started doing all of our live reports inside the Mall of America in Boston City. You know, you got to get out. <laughs> so we went down to an area that they had set aside for fans attending the Super Bowl with a lot of beautiful uh, Super Bowl type ice sculptures and all that sort of stuff. But it was cold. And, you know, we'd get back in the car at, um, you know, 1130 and, it, you know, the thermostat in the car would say minus 15 degrees. <sighs> So it was cold. So that would, that would be my least well, that stadium. Favorite. That stadium was, uh, was pretty new, I think. Right. At the yes, time that must've yes. been unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah. That was, that was the best part of it. Um, but I, I would have to say that the city that surprised me the most, the one that I expected, I wouldn't care for, but that surprised me and I enjoyed was Indianapolis. Really? Wow. You know, it was, everything was centrally located. You could walk to a lot of things. I could walk to my hotel. I could walk downtown. Um, you know, walk to the stadium. So, uh, you know, walk to the team hotels. That was, that was, that was pretty good. I, I, I really enjoyed it. I thought they did a great job. You know, I, I'm of a mind that I really think that New Orleans should be in the mix uh, every few years. That's a great city to host a Super yeah. Bowl or any big event. You know, I've been there for Super Bowl and for Final Four. Um, <clears throat> and then I think, you know, the Miami area is great. And then someplace out excuse me, out West. I thought, you know, Arizona, Glendale, you know, the, the stadium was far outside of um, Phoenix. So that was kind of difficult. Uh, we went a couple times to Houston. That was okay. Uh, Jacksonville, I didn't care for. So yeah, <laughs> there you go. But nine Super Bowls you've been to, that's pretty good. Um, I know. Yeah. Very fortunate. <laughs> Very fortunate. Definitely. Um, so I, you've covered a, a lot of a lot of athletes in throughout your time in in, in Boston sports. Who's been uh, some of your favorite to cover? Um, well, um, let's see. You know, Bobby Orr. You know, I didn't. I started after his career ended, but every time I saw him, even after he retired, he was always always the best. Um, you know. Larry Bird was always accessible. I mean, talking about some of the big names, but right. even even the guys who weren't the frontline guys were were you know many of them were very very gracious. Um, trying to think, maybe if I could pick one from every sport, you know, Patrice Bergeron currently right. with the Bruins yeah. has been great. Uh, the head coach of the current head coach of the Bruins is fantastic. Um, Bruce Cassidy, um, Celtics, 
you know, we talked to Casey Jones, who passed away just recently, was always great. Um, so Red Sox, uh, Red Sox are tough. Yeah. Red Sox are tough, <laughs> you know, because, and I always, you know, I, I try and be sympathetic, you know, here, here's athletes of a sport that start in February and end in October or later, if you're in the playoffs and right. basically it's every day. So every day you've got the media talking to you. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a grind, so it's a little bit tougher to uh, uh, to get to know those guys. At least you know for someone who's not there every day. For a lot of the beat writers, it's 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 a little bit easier. You know, Tom Brady when when he first started was was great. You know, he's a little bit more guarded now. Right. Um, but uh, you know, he was great. He, I always felt that he he knew he knew what he he knew how to handle us. He knew what it was about. You know, uh, we, that we had a job to do and right. that you know, he was, he was forthcoming with, with uh, information and stuff. So I would say, yeah, those, those are the highlights of, yeah. uh, of the, I'm sure I'm forgetting somebody, but that's what first. And comes to uh, I saw that you, you carried the, uh, the Olympic torch back in 2006. What was that experience like for you? Yeah, twice. Yeah, I did it. Um, I did it in 2000, uh, no, 2002 and 1996. So 1996. Uh, the torch run happens in the country where the Olympics is being held. So in 96, the Olympics were in Atlanta. So I ran it prior to that summer games. And then in 2002, prior to the Salt Lake City Games, which was the winter games, yeah. it was uh, an incredible, incredible experience. And I have both of the torches um mounted uh, at home uh what what a great experience and to to feel yeah. like you're a part of that um you know that that flame that you know that you had is eventually the one that that lights the cauldron at yeah. the olympics so that yeah, was very cool special very cool. moment yeah <laughs> yeah yeah and you have been uh and you have an acting gig under your belt as well you uh you were in the movie uh bleed for this i believe yeah, back in that, 2006 and- uh, 2016 actually, it, yeah there was another one after that but you, but believe for this was was very cool it, it was the Vinny Paz story uh, yep. how he fractured his neck uh, came back to win world titles um, and that meant it, much of that was filmed in Rhode Island in fact I think all of it was and uh, so I kind of reprised my role as the ring announcer because I was a ring announcer for probably about 20 of Vinny's fights and um, and so one of the fights that I was actually in uh, ring announcer for they recreated at the Dunkin Donuts Center in Providence. And that's the one they had me uh, go in and, and do an interview for. And so it was it was kind of cool, you know, movie magic and all that. I yeah. mean, it's uh, it's a lot different routine than what I'm used to. I'm used to, you know, deadlines and quick, quick, yeah. quick. And there it was like, you know, hurry up and wait. But it was it was just very cool to do it. And then, you know, to see it on the big screen. And um, so, yeah. So, and then the vault was the other one. I actually played, yeah, I played uh, an attorney in that one for uh, the guy who played Raymond Patriarch, Chaz Palminteri, uh, who you may be familiar. So that was kind of cool to meet him. Cause I, you know, was, uh, you know, I was very uh, much a fan of the Bronx tale, uh, his, yeah. his movie. Yeah. So yeah, it was kind of neat to do something different. Yeah. How, I mean, what yeah. was that like? I mean, you're used to being on, on screen obviously. So was it pretty, pretty similar to, to do, to do a movie? It was more natural for me to do bleed for this because I was basically doing what I usually do. I mean, I've done, yeah. And I, you know, I interviewed the guy who played Vinnie Paz, Miles Teller, uh, which is what I always do. And then, um, but the other one was a little more difficult because the director told me, listen, we're going to improvise a little bit. And, uh, and he really didn't, you know, tell me uh, how he wanted it to go. And I wasn't sure because there wasn't necessarily any dialogue, but you know, I had to kind of react to what, uh, the guy sitting next to me was doing so that was a little bit uh that was a little bit difficult not having the the training of a professional actor. exactly (laughs) and then um obviously you've you know throughout you know these last 40 years uh with nbc10 you've gotten uh obviously to know a lot of people that have that have worked there um most notably uh catherine tappan was there when when she was first starting and obviously you were a big mentor uh, for her. And obviously she's carved out a fantastic career for herself. Yeah. So, um, you know, what, what was she like when she was first starting out and, and did you see this success coming that she's, that she's had? It's funny that we're talking about this. Cause I was just talking with, uh, 
Tim McCone, who's working with me tonight here at NBC 10 about Catherine. And he asked me the exact same question. <laughs> and, I, you know, honestly, you know, when I saw her videotape, she had won a contest at CBS Sports Network to be a sportscaster. She was at Rutgers. She was uh, running track and she auditioned and she was in this contest and that she eventually won. And she did some studio shows. And and so she came in here and, you know, she didn't have, um, I don't, I'm not sure that she did any field work or what uh, field reporting, but she was just such a quick learner, you know, and, and she's just a, uh, you know, a, a great young woman and just was so uh, interested in learning. Um, you know, she, she came in with her eyes wide open and, and, and really did a great job. And, you know, I think that's part of what has made her and kept her a success is the fact that this is a woman who always does her homework, you know, and, and uh, I just, I'm, I'm a big, I'm a big fan of hers and we remain yeah. friends and, and uh, I, I just think she does a great job. So yeah. uh, when did I know, I, you know, as soon as she walked in the door, if not yeah. before that, you know, this, this girl was, was going somewhere. Yeah. yeah. How often do you you stay in touch with her every now and then? I mean, you, yeah. I'm sure you've seen her at uh, you know these different events like the you know championships that you've covered, uh, especially yeah. the Stanley Cups um, with her, um, you know, working for NBC. So I'm sure you've uh, been able to keep in yeah. contact with her. Yeah, when she was based in Boston, we play golf occasionally and we exchange texts. And and if I'm in New York and she's there, that we'll grab lunch or whatever. But uh, but yeah, we do we do keep in touch. But I'm. Uh, one of her biggest fans. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure. Well, I don't want to keep you for too long. So one last, uh, one last question for you. Obviously, what's um, what's a, a bit of six, um, what's something that you would tell a young broadcaster that's uh, that's coming into the business? What's your big piece of advice uh, for somebody? Uh, well, I think that you know you, you got to be prepared to to do whatever you got to do. You know, I mean, if yeah. it's working nights or, you know, we have people here where I, or I think, I'm not sure how they do it, that, you know, are here at 1130 at night to do the sunrise show that gets over at seven o'clock in the morning. That's a tough shift, you know, but they, you know, these are people who are dedicated, who want, you know, who are dedicated journalists, whether they be a producer or, or on the air as a reporter or an anchor, you know, come into it with your eyes wide open, you know, understand, um, you know, what it is you're getting yourself into. And, you know, internship is important. If you can't do an internship, then then do some cold calls to people who are in the business and, you know, do a little interview with them. Say, hey, what, what's your job like? You know, what what is to what's to be expected of someone who's just starting in the business? You know, the more information that you can have before you, you know, you uh, take your first step, the, I think the better off you're going to be. And I find that, you know, kids coming out of college now are so much better prepared to get into the business than I was when I came out of college. You know, the, these many of these college programs, you know, really um, immerse the kids in this business and, and teach them how to use cameras and, and, and work on their writing and work on their editing skills so that when they get here, you know, they're not kind of starting from scratch much the way that I did when I, when I arrived. You know, a lot of these kids come in here hitting the, the ground running and, and typically it's usually their second, second stop. So, uh, you know, they've had some experience, but, you know, there's a lot of talented people who are coming yeah. into the business now and, and I get a kick out of seeing them come in and do their thing. And, and if they're successful, moving on to the next big step. So, yeah. Well, Frank, thank you for uh, taking the time uh, out of your busy schedule to come on. I appreciate it. Hey, Matt, my, uh, my pleasure. I really enjoyed it and best yeah. of luck to you. Thanks. All right. Thanks for thank you. Okay. All right.